Uh, and so with that, I'll just uh, start with my declarations. Um, here we go. Um, so like most docs in academic centers, I generate revenue through a variety of means. I look after patients and I bill for that. I get supported to do research by my hospital and my research institute and my university. I'm on the editorial advisory board for the medical letter. I get a small stipend for that. And I do do uh, some medical legal work and that sometimes touches on analgesics and sometimes opioids in particular. Um, I'm a member of a US group called PROF, which is an acronym for Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. And I would encourage you to visit this link. Uh, it's a tremendous resource, but I, I guess I put this up here. This is a volunteer NGO and I, I, I don't get um, any kind of payment for it, but members of PROF are people who I think advocate for opioid stewardship in a sort of a, sort of a sensible way. But we are to no small extent derided by people who have different views about the use of opioids for acute and chronic pain. And I'll touch on that for a bit over the course of my talk. So until COVID kind of hit in early 2020, uh, you know, this, this topic more or less dominated the news, especially out here, out west. Um, but this is a complex, multifaceted societal crisis that isn't just obviously about pain medicine. Even though I'm going to focus on that today. Um, I, I think the thing I want to start with is that for those of you who are, you know, recently graduated in the last kind of 10 years or so, um, the way you view opioids as analgesics is very different from the way I was taught. I went, to, I did a degree in pharmacy first, and then in 1990-94, I was a medical student. And I worked as a pharmacist. But it wasn't very common for us to use opioids in the same way we do now. And I think it's worth looking a little bit into the rearview mirror, sort of to understand how we are in the current mess that we are in, because this bears on how we should, I think, use these drugs. So in the 80s, again, I'm mid-80s, I started university as a pharmacy student at Dalhousie. I wasn't prescribing at the time, obviously, but it was, I'm told, the case that doctors often avoided opioids, even when they might be validly indicated. Um, sometimes even at the end of life, people would be dying with, you know, painful nets from, you know, prostate or breast cancer. And doctors were reluctant to use opioids. And I think they were reluctant for probably two reasons. And maybe the folks in the crowd who antedate me will have some insights on this. But I think they're, A, that their teachers hadn't really done this um, a lot. And, but also they were worried, I think, about unmasking addiction and people who might have a predisposition to a genetic uh, or otherwise, but it's fair to say there's a large unmet need here. And so um, the thing I want to highlight is that in the late 80s and really in the early to mid 90s, there came to be this push for the more liberal prescribing of opioids uh, in a way that we hadn't before. Uh, there were books written about this. There were partnerships with, uh, with patient groups that in some instances were more or less just fronts for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but I think the key point I want to make is that a lot of the push to use opioids in a way that we hadn't historically came from Purdue and companies like it. Now, you, you will all know about Purdue, of course, by now, but, uh, but the SAC is privately owned company based in Stanford, Connecticut. And the family um, was at one point one of the wealthiest families in the U.S., largely on the basis of selling drugs like OxyContin. And uh, lots of this in the popular media, you have, I'm sure, all seen at least some of these. Uh, I tried watching dope stick. It just felt a bit too much like work for me. <laughs> if you want us, if you want a, a sort of a distillation of this, I mean, Patrick Radden keeps peace in the New Yorker is about 15 minutes read and gives you a good sense of some of the things Purdue did and didn't do that helped get us into this mess. Um, one of the things they did was give up this book. I'm curious to know if anyone in the room has a copy of this book. I've got a couple of copies of this book. Yeah, so you didn't. Tom has a copy of this book. He didn't buy it. He got it for free, as did thousands of health profession students across Canada, medicine, mm -hmm. pharmacy, nursing, and so forth. It's actually a pretty good book in some ways, uh, but it was bankrolled by Purdue. I mean, uh, it's ostensibly the output of the Canadian Pain Society, but Purdue paid for this book. And one of the things in the book that I have, have always galled me is this modified WHO analgesic ladder. So one of the things I didn't mention a moment ago is that in the 80s, one of the things that happened to help push opioid prescribing was the World Health Organization in 1986 said, please start using opioids more liberally for patients with cancer pain. And that stepped approach, that ladder, 
has now been adapted and adopted and I would say bastardized in some ways. But here's here's uh, Purdue Pharma's OH, WHO analgesic ladder. I just want to ask the people in the crowd to reflect for a moment on uh, <laughs> how it might be that oxycodone is both a weak and a strong opioid. I mean, this is just this is just a lie. I mean, and this is a, this is a good example of, and I believed this myself for a while as a pharmacist and an, an internist for the early kind of 2000s, I thought it must be a weak opioid. And I can't believe how I fell for it. But um, so this is an impossibility. And this is a good example of pharma getting its tentacles into medical education. So I don't know how many doctors out there um, in the 2000s came into practice thinking that oxy was more or less on par with codeine or tramadol, which is just not. Um, I'm going to take a chance here. This is a brief, roughly two minute video clip of a promotional um, video from Purdue Pharma. I have some trepidation about hitting the play button, but we'll see what happens with the feedback. Let's see what happens here. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. Okay, so um, this was a message that I think we were happy to hear. I mean, so... so you know, we're in the basis of in the business of relieving suffering, and to suddenly be told that you can use these drugs that are derived from the opium poppy in a way that you haven't historically was to people who want to relieve suffering was kind of good news. Um, but but it, you notice that Alan Spanos in his video there he mentioned that the rate of addiction was less than one percent, and I, I I wish in '98 or 2000 at one of these lectures that I attended uh, from prominent pain experts in Canada, and the statement was made that I, I wish I had the insight or, or foresight to ask, how do they know that? What was the what was the evidence to support that assertion, given that it was something you never did, historically? And had I done so, I would have, uh, had I raised my hand and asked the question, I, I would have undoubtedly been put, uh, pointed towards the Porter and Jick study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980. So this study um, not only appears in arguably the most prominent medical journal on the planet, it has a pretty unambiguous title, uh, Addiction Rare in Patients Treated with Narcotics. And had I wanted to read this article, um, I would have had to go to the library. This was not available online until 2010. So here is the article that I would have found uh, had I gone to the library <laughs> to, um, to follow through on the assertion that, uh, that addiction was a rare occurrence. So again, the title's unambiguous. You, you, you can't just get this online until 2010. This is a, exactly 100 words long. It's, 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 it's five sentences, and it says exactly nothing about the incidence of addiction during chronic opioid therapy. Uh, it didn't stop it from being cited liberally hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, in fact, we, we, we published an analysis of the citation profile of that paper, and uh, about 70, so about 74% of all articles that cited it, 600 plus articles cited that, 120 citations per sentence. I mean, think about that. It's pretty uncommon in medical uh, studies. Uh, but the vast majority of citing articles more or less parroted the, the, me the message from the title that addiction was rare. It was based on nothing. So, so again, we took this promotion. We began to prescribe, this is U.S. data. We don't have the same sort of good quality data in Canada, but prescribing went through the roof. And it's understandable that it went through the roof, and we can talk about that a little bit later. This is an old heat map from the New York Times, but it's interesting. You know, so Oxy's launched in the mid '90s. It starts to really get its toehold in Appalachia in terms of misuse in sort of '99, 2000. But look what happens over the ensuing sort of 12 years um, with the number of you know, these are dead bodies. These are these are these are people who are no longer alive, and you know, over the span of the 25 years or so. Since the launch of this drug, the U.S. has lost somewhere in the order of six hundred thousand people uh, from opioid-related deaths. Most of them are people with addiction, um, and we're going to come back to this in a bit. But we're talking about just a vast, vast 
uh, number of, of dead people. Canada, by the way, has never didn't even start tracking national death stats from opioids until 2016. Uh, I, I'm, I think we we're roughly 50 to 60,000 over that same time period. Um, now, obviously, this is the crisis that we're in today is different from the crisis from 20 years ago, right? Uh, and it, this has a lot to do with the emergence over the last decade in our drug supply of fentanyl and its analogs. It's become, a, and not to mention, designer benzos and other compounds. This is a, a very different animal now than it was, say, 15 years ago. <laughs> These drugs are all opioids, all right? Um, they all bind to mu opioid receptors. That is how they affect their. Uh, beneficial and their harmful effects. The drugs on top are opiates. We sometimes use these terms interchangeably. It's not actually pedantry. The, the things on top either come from the opium poppy or they are tweaked molecules of products of the poppy. The stuff on the bottom, you don't need a PhD in chemistry to appreciate that fentanyl is just different. I mean, you can make this in a bathtub. I like to joke, not a bathtub, but you can certainly make it in a lab. And here are uh, three labs. I think the one in the lower left, it's been a while since I've created this. I think it might be in Burnaby. But my upper left is China, and the one on the right, I think, is in Western Mexico or in the, sort of the central area of Mexico. So these are all labs that are, are making this stuff because there's a market that is much larger than it ever was before. Mm -hmm. And it's dirt cheap to produce. For a few hundred dollars, you can go online and get guaranteed delivery of large amounts of fentanyl to your home uh, or to your P.O. box, more likely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just being, um, you know, re replacing heroin. It's being added to pills. Um, and not just opioid pills, but here's an interesting paper from about a decade ago, I think, in California, where they seized a bunch of fake pills. Um, I ask you to look at these pills. One of these pills came from a pharmacy, and the other came from a guy. Okay, so the, the, it's a little hard to tell. I think the one from the guy is going on the top. The little blemish kind of gives it away, but you can see they're pretty, pretty comparable, right? And what's neat about these pills is this: look at the fentanyl content of these pills. So the the bioavailability of orally administered fentanyl varies, but it's on the order of around 30%. So the translation of this is that if I take a, one of these tabs, the single tablet that was supposed to have six or 800 micrograms of fentanyl, and it's got 10 times that, I mean, I'm probably going to stop breathing and die unless I'm, unless I've got a very, very entrenched tolerance. So, so this is a testament to the fact that, and you guys know this in BC better than we know it in Ontario that the drug supply is just much more toxic than it's ever been and it's courtesy of labs like that filling a void um, that we've helped create so that, that that's a very brief um skim of the sort of the genesis and evolution of the opioid crisis i will say that not everyone agrees with my distillation of things uh that's okay they're not giving the talk i am so, uh, <laughs> now let's talk about treating pain so uh we don't have a lot of Sort of tools in our bag, right? I mean, most of us have a have an approach more or less like this. Like we start with acetaminophen or NSAIDs. Um, if those don't work, as they often don't, we escalate maybe to weak, ostensibly weak opioids. Um, and if those don't work, we go to morphine or something stronger, and we'll pepper into the mix some pregabalin, some cannabinoids, some SSRI, you, you name it. Okay. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I'll talk about many of these. But I think the, the point is that we've got this approach that um, I think it's fair to say most of us use something like this, right? And this is in its, at its core um, based on the WHO pain ladder from 86. So, I mean, I start tomorrow morning, I inherit, I don't know, 20 patients on our medicine ward. Um, and I will undoubtedly uh, have a patient in pain and I'll have a medical student or a resident and I'll ask them, um, you know, so, so you're gonna start a patient on pain medicine. I ask them, what are they trying to do? What are they really trying to do? Do we have any brave medical students or residents on the on the call? Actually, we have one in the room here. Tyler, are you, are you you're not technically a resident still? No, but okay. But no. Just pretend you were. <laughs> pretend you were. Sure. Yeah. So 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 you're you're my PGY three, and you had this guy with a horrible lumbar radiculopathies in emerge, and you're gonna you're gonna reach for some pain medicine. What, what's your goal? Uh, relieving pain adequately to a level where they can function yeah. safely. Yeah. Excellent. What are you really trying to do? Uh, Get them out of hospital. <laughs> you're trying to <laughs> reduce pain, uh, improve ambulation, right? Decrease length of stay, increase return to work, improve quality of life. Those are those are the answers that we always think about. But we're not actually just doing that, right? We're doing more than just changing a number, right? It's great if their pain is a 10 and, and with some medicine, we get down to a three. Um, but we're doing more than just that. And I think the thing that we're really trying to do, if we accept for a moment, any drug that we might deploy for pain 
has potential benefits and potential harms, the, it sounds a bit facile to say it, but I mean, we're obviously trying to afford the patient more benefits than harms. It's just that our, by our nature, we tend to focus on the benefits in the short term. Um, so I think the point to me is that when, when you're reaching for a medicine for a new patient, you really are conducting an experiment. It's, it, we know what the goal is, is to help them with an harm. We don't know if we're going to afford the patient any benefits or any harms for that matter until we've given them the drug. So the act of starting somebody on a pain medicine is in a very real way a, a, an actual experiment on the patient, and this is our goal. And this is easy when you can spot and be confident about the benefits and spot and be confident about the harms. But I'm going to put it to you that we're actually not as good as, at this as we might think we are. Mm -hmm. And I'll unpack this as we go. Okay, So some harms are easy, right? I'll start with acetaminophen. Um, everyone knows where Tylenol gets its name? It's from the, uh, the, the chemical name of the drug. Okay, so that's, if you're wondering where Tylenol got its name, it's from the structure. Um, small little molecule. Every one of you has it in your medicine cabinet. It is, it is a testament to the fact that we prioritize, we put value on relieving pain. It's a pretty meager analgesic. I mean, here's the thought. This is from the dental literature, but it gives you a sense of sort of the, the, the effect size of acetaminophen in patients with dental pain. So uh, on this, uh, on this zero to, it should be 10, but it's truncated to the vertical axis. On the classical zero to 10 pain scale, the minimal clinically important difference is around one. Depends where you read, but around one. So you'll get a bit of a blip of analgesia, but it won't last for very long. I think, um, you know, when I have a headache, I'll sometimes imagine myself taking two Tylenol tablets and an hour and a half or two later, the headache's gone. And I recognize that's just the natural course of many headaches. It's regression to the mean and I'm better. And had I taken acetaminophen and gotten better, I would have blamed the acetaminophen or attributed the improvement to acetaminophen rather than just the normal course of many headaches. So the, we all are appreciate, I think we all appreciate really the only meaningful toxicity with some rare bird exceptions. Uh, is liver injury. This isn't acetaminophen, it's its main metabolite, NAPKI. And if you take healthy young people who don't drink alcohol and you put them on four grams a day, you'll see an increase in ALT or ASC in about two thirds of them, right? And occasionally you'll see ALTs in the two or three hundreds. It's not common, but it can happen. So this is a, this is something that uh, I think when I finished, when I started Clean Farm in 98, um, I had the belief, and I think I may have been taught that this didn't happen, but it's clearly been shown in two studies, at least two studies now, that this is a, a, a regular occurrence in people on four grams a day. Um, the liver's magical, you stop it, it gets better, uh, it goes away, but just be aware of it. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about acetaminophen. Uh, NSAIDs, these are drugs we use all the time. And I, I'm guessing that many of you have these in your medicine cabinets too, okay? How do they work? They work by blocking the synthesis of prostaglandin. They block cyclooxygenase, and this is in the business of making prostaglandins, but there are some good prostaglandins and some bad ones. We want to selectively inhibit the bad ones, but the, the good ones, I mean, they do things like maintain the integrity of our gastric mucosa and our renal blood flow. So you can predict, you can get a sense of what the main toxicities would be. I mean, most capable medical students will identify this as a fairly predictable consequence. Uh, and I guess I would also just uh, parenthetically make the point here that if, when I think back to my PGY one year, 94 to 95. Like we saw a lot of GI bleeds. Um, I think more, a lot of incident related GI bleeds, you know, we don't see the same number now. And I think it's probably a reflection of the fact that we were using NSAIDs in a way uh, then that we, we were using more of them back in the early 90s because we weren't using opioids. We saw a lot more of their harms and we're, 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 we're finally attuned to them. But it was, I think back to all the patients I looked after with GI bleeds, it was, I think this was one of the things that helped promote opioids because opioids didn't cause GI bleeds and they didn't cause um, kidney injury. So the, this gives you a sense of, or this is one of our first studies looking at the, the long-term risk of GI bleeds. Like they clearly have them um, and there will be factors that influence individual susceptibility, age uh, among them, anticoagulant use. But you get a sense of the, of the risk over time here, right? Like this is over the course of just not quite a year, but this is not a common problem. Give these drugs to millions of patients to see plenty of bleed. But the point is, at an individual level, um, this is not uh, uh, a guaranteed phenomenon by any stretch. So most of us also recognize the other chief toxicity of NSAIDs is kidney injury. Um, and there's a couple of ways they can do it, but the main one is by compromising uh, our, our renal blood flow. So, so, so prostaglandins normally keep the afferent arterial open, promoting glomerular perfusion. 
Um, if you block the synthesis of prostaglandins, the A4 arterial constricts down, your creatinine might go from 70 to 170. This is largely a hemodynamic and reversible phenomenon. Now, I uh, was taught, and I think I probably did teach, that you should avoid NSAIDs in patients with kidney disease. This is a, a piece written by some colleagues in Ottawa on uh, making the argument that it's kind of a little bit irrational to completely avoid NSAIDs in patients with CKD. We have a an obvious barometer of a problem. Right? Someone's got a creatinine clearance of 65 mils a minute. It might be the sort of natural inclination to say, oh, I can't use an NSAID in that patient. But if you did, it's not like you're committing them to dialysis, right? You give them an NSAID, their creatinine goes up 30 or 40 points, and you say, we kicked at that can, we tried it. Um, so the point is that there are there are some people, the, the lower the creatinine clearance, the less um, easy it is to defend, but it's not as though uh, simply having an abnormal creatinine is um, a contraindication to NSAIDs. The other thing I think is important, because the opioids live in the, the WHO ladder, any ladder you see, they live above NSAIDs. And I think that gives us the impression that opioids are better analgesics, they're stronger analgesics. You've heard, in fact, you've heard in that video clip, uh, Alan Spano say that there are best, strongest pain relievers. That's not true, okay? If you take nothing else from this presentation, just expunge that from your consciousness. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's acute or chronic pain. Here's a, a nice review from Jason Bussa a few years ago. I won't go over all the details, but the key point is that in when you compare opioid, opioids with active comparators, in, you can't find a study. I, I define, defy you to find a randomized trial looking at opioids versus NSAIDs that shows that opioids afford more analgesia. It just doesn't, it's not true. Here it's renal collar. This is a systematic review, and I'll focus you just, you know, down here on the overall effect. Mm -hmm. This is on the, the outcome of looking for additional analgesia. Again, if anything, it favors the NSAIDs. And chronic pain, I mean, the only, the only long-term randomized trial of opioids versus an active comparator is this paper from five years ago in JAMA. Um, and I won't, again, go over the whole thing, but it's a pragmatic clinical trial. I think it's very well done. And the key points to make here is that non-opioid treatment was actually associated with significantly better pain intensity. So statistically significant, clinically not entirely clear, but if anything, NSAID patients had less pain than patients on opioids. Come back to that in a minute. And there was no advantage from opioids in this, in this study. So I think um, it's, it's, it's very clear that uh, it's going to be impossible, I think, to expunge this perception. Um, but I, I beat it out of my medical students and residents as much as I can, um, uh, not physically, uh, uh, but they, they show up with a belief that opioids are stronger. And it's just, there's nothing to back that up. With the mythology of the poppy, I don't know. So, so back in our overarching goal of therapeutics, which is to help more than harm, it, this requires that you perceive all of the adverse effects. And it's pretty easy to do with NSAIDs, and it's very easy to do with receiving medicine. It's just tougher with opioids, okay? So if I have my medical students tomorrow, this is what are some side effects of opioids? And this, this is kind of how it goes. You, you can tell their mind because they're asleep. But uh, they'll say constipation. They all get that, right? They'll say sedation. They all get that. Some of the more clever ones will say, I get nausea, some caritis. This has happened to me after taking opioids. Um, respiratory depression. You take enough, you breathe less frequently, and then eventually you stop breathing. They'll float addiction and they'll float overdose. And most of them stop here. Okay. These are all legit side effects of opioids, but there's a whole lot more. And so remember, this is our objective helping more than harming. And you've all seen us, you've all done this probably. You've seen people whose analgesia wasn't quite adequate. And what did we do? We just increased the opioid dose in a way that we you wouldn't historically do would say see you wouldn't put somebody on eight grams of Tylenol all day and you wouldn't put somebody on 1600 of ibuprofen every four hours because you would think that's crazy to do because the dose makes the poison and the higher the dose the more side effects you're going to have for some reason that we don't think that way with opioids we just escalate the dose as tolerance sets in there's a right word shift in the dose response curve we just increase the dose um, and it's very easy to find yourself in a situation where all of these side effects that we sometimes don't think about as side effects, um, can, where you're in a situation where the, where the harming sort of is outweighing the helping. Every side effect up here, every potential, I should call these potential adverse effects. Of course it's true 
that not every motor vehicle collision in a person on opioids is caused by opioids. And of course it is true that not every instance of depression is caused by opioids. Chronic pain itself is obviously a potential risk factor for depression. But there's a good case to be made for every one of these potential adverse effects that opioids can play a role. And then that role can be um, potentially reversed by gradual dose reduction. We'll come back to that later. But if I had to single out one side effect or one potential adverse effect in this list that I think is, uh, is one that we as healthcare professionals really need to think about, it's dependence. Mm -hmm. And I wanna, you notice that dependence and addiction are not the same here, right? I think most people, many people, lay, lay people in particular will conflate the two. Mm -hmm. um, and even some, some clinicians will too. Let me introduce you to my friend, Travis Reeder. So Travis is a bioethicist in, um, at Johns Hopkins. It was a conference call with him a couple of days ago. Uh, and I know Travis because of this piece he wrote in the Washington Post in 2017. Um, if you prescribe opioids to patients, you owe it to yourself to read this article. Okay, I'm gonna summarize the article. So, so Travis is, uh, has the misfortune of, uh, of owning a motorcycle. Uh, he is gets an accident where a van driver crushes his left foot. And, and Travis is brought to hospital and he's in hospital for about a month. And he's got multiple surgeries. He, he's in fear of losing his foot. They eventually salvage him. He goes home uh, and he's on opioids. And at about the two month mark, he goes back to see his orthopedic surgeon who says, oh, you're doing really well. But you know, you're you should probably think about coming down on that oxycodone. He doesn't say in this piece, but he was on at the time 120 milligrams of oxycodone per day. So pretty healthy dose. Healthy isn't the right word. Pretty <laughs> solid dose of, of, of oxycodone. Um, I don't think any of us are going to contend uh, take issue with the notion that opioids after multiple foot surgeries is a bad thing. But I want you to see what he went through. So he decides to take it. Um, it was down by 25% a week. Okay, so his first week, he just feels crappy. He's got nausea, anorexia, can't sleep. His pain gets worse. He spends most of that week on a couch. Now he's down to 60 milligrams of oxy. The anorexia is worsened. He's sweating. He's shivering. He's crying spontaneously. Sleep is nearly impossible. Here's a quote from week three, 30 milligrams. It felt like being on fire inside with muscles that restlessly twitch. I stopped trying to sleep in my bed. Instead, I never left the couch napping for 90 minutes at a time. I alternated between sweating and being covered with goosebumps. And I had several crying spells a day. The depression was crushing. I mean, this guy's really, really in dire straits. His wife is desperate. She calls the family dog who says, you know, maybe it's time to go back on the meds. And they contemplated it, but he decided to stick with it. And you can imagine, by the way, he's on 30 of the a here. Imagine if he had gone to 60 or even up to 90, right? How much better, how, how much all of this would have been obliterated? So here's week four. Uh, after I took my final dose of opioids at the start of week four, I thought withdrawal might kill me. The nausea left me curled up on the floor of the bathroom in the middle of the night. I couldn't get to the toilet quickly enough on my walker. I went three days without real sleep and for the first time in my life had suicidal thoughts. So I think we want to reflect on this anecdote. I mean, the primary currency when people tell me that opioids are beneficial in chronic pain, the primary currency is anecdote right? or collections of anecdotes, case series. This anecdote is of equal value. I'd say even greater value. This man has a PhD, has a wife, he's got a good job. Um, and he thought about ending his life because of the side effect of opioid. Um, just let that sink in for a minute, right? So the other, I just want to spend a minute on this phenomenon of hyperalgesia. The, par the idea that opioids can sometimes make pain paradoxically worse. This is... Um, this concept is anathema in the in the in the, in the, the pain lobby. I'll call it. And the people who have different views on opioids than I do just say this doesn't happen. It's only in animals and so on. Not true. It was very clearly demonstrated in multiple converging lines of evidence. But the one I like the most is this um, systematic review of what happens when you take people on long-term opioid therapy and gradually reduce their dose voluntarily, but gradually reduce their dose. Twelve thousand people. And here I've grouped the studies based upon their quality and what happens. So you can see that in the better quality studies, if anything, when the dose goes down, the pain gets better. But why would that be? Hmm. Do you have an alternate hypothesis? No. Right? Um, that, that this, that's just pain reduction. What about quality of life? You see more or less the same thing. So again, taper too quickly, misery ensues. 
taper under the, you know, the, the, under the watchful eye of somebody who knows what they're doing, and patients often feel better. Okay. So it's deprescribing, but it's not just stopping a statin isn't needed or stopping some stopping some drug a patient doesn't need. You can't do that here. So so now we're back to the, the question that I guess I want to talk about. You know, what constitutes responsible prescribing? You will get different answers to this question depending on who you ask. But I, I think these are defensible answers. And I think we want to start with the, uh, the fact that there are three kinds of people in the world, right? There are those who understand statistics and there are those who don't. <laughs> That's a joke. There are three kinds of people in the world. There are people who are on, on opioids and they've got opioid use disorder, and I'm not talking about that, right? Uh, these people need very specialized care. You know this as well as I do. They need to not die today from their ongoing use of a, of a, of a, of a, a drug, drugs that are just horrendously toxic. And there, there's lots of things that they need done. And if we were um, perhaps a better society, we might have done them already. Um, people who are on opioids, someone who's been on opioids for five or 10 years, right? And maybe they're on 100 or 200 or 300 milligrams of morphine or equivalent. Um, I'm not really even talking about them. I'll come back to them in a minute. I'm talking about the person who's not on opioid yet in whom you're trying to just to weigh whether you should start it or not. Let's focus on this group three. This is the bulk of the population. Okay. So um, it, this is how I think I prescribe them. The first is I don't start them the same way I used to. So 2003, 20 years ago, I'm you know, five years into my internal medicine practice. I use them all the time. They sometimes work, um, but uh, I, I'm pretty confident I harmed thousands of patients in the course of my practice. Um, this is key, right? I mean, I, I, the, the messaging we got was that yes, tolerance happens, and yes, the analgesia will attenuate over time. It's okay, you can just go up on the dose, and we all did it. And I still remember vividly, maybe in 2003 or five, a young man with sickle crisis who, who came in, and in hindsight, he, in fact, in hindsight, I saw it in the moment, he had an unhealthy relationship with his medicines. He was on chronic, on, uh, on opiates chronically, but what did I do? We can be on 200 oxycodone a day. I just went up on his opiate as if it was that simple, as if what this guy needed was just more mu agonism, and that's all he needed for his pain relief. I mean, it's it's shocking to me how, uh, in hindsight, how much I lacked creativity uh, and uh, didn't think about the other things that might have been, which we'll come to. Sensible prescription quantities. Okay, here's a classmate of mine an infectious disease doc in Halifax now, whose his daughter, this is an older tweet, but you know, gets your wisdom teeth out and got a prescription for 50 Percocet. Okay, that's, you know, unless the surgeon removed her mandible, she probably doesn't need 50 Percocet. Uh, and so I think this is the sort of thing that, um, like this is really hard to justify today. She's gonna take two or three or four or five tablets in the world. Maybe she'll take them all. And then we have a different problem. Or maybe they'll live in the medicine cabinet for a year or two until they're discovered by the younger sibling who then experiments with these things and falls into the trap of addiction. There's no better way, short of ramping up the dose, there's no better way to kill somebody with opioids than to prescribe other CNS depressants and benzos in particular. Mm -hmm. um, this is a challenging, challenging, uh, lots of patients on both, but we should try to avoid doing it to fewer patients. Um, in people who are already on opioids, I think there's a case to be made for gradual collaborative dose reduction. Um, I think you can even make the case for dose, dose reduction in patients who don't want it, but that is a, an ethically fraught and challenging and very subtle <clears throat> discussion of its own. But, but taking, uh, maybe I'll reframe this. You know, the when our guideline came out in 2017, suggesting that we try to avoid going up more than 90 milligrams of morphine per day, um, that's in patients you're starting with opioids and, and maybe contemplating dose escalation. It's not in people, not this is not meant for people on two or 300 of morphine a day. The last thing you want to do is take someone down from 200 to say 100 overnight because that's going to make them suffer as Travis Reeder did. So uh, so I think these are just some general common sense principles on how to use opioids. Um, and, and maybe the most important is, you know, if someone's got an appendectomy or a cholecystectomy, or a knee injury, and they might need opioids for two or three or four days. Um, what you don't want is that person being on opioids two or three months from now. And this is a real big deal, okay? New persistent opioid use is a side effect of opioids, right? Um, and I think it relates in part the fact that dependence 
sets in very quickly. Like I can make dependence, I, I can induce dependence in Tom within a couple of days. Solid amount of Percocet, excuse, yeah, two Percocets, four times a day, two or three days, and we stop them, and you will have features of opioid withdrawal. It's just, it just it will, will vary depending on the person. But look at this, you know, the the idea that people after you know spine surgery, they, they they come into hospital, they're not on opioids, they have spinal surgery, they're prescribed opioids. Thirteen percent of them are still on them six or nine months later. Would you believe? I don't have it up here, but the second. So in the U.S., uh, I'm going to maybe mangle this, but among men who have a vasectomy who aren't on an opioid at the time of vasectomy, they among those who get opioids post-op, which still kind of surprises me that you need that, seven percent of them are on opioids three months later. But that's kind of crazy, right? So, so we, by virtue of our well-intentioned prescribing and giving people maybe more than is really needed. We create this pool of people who have now ongoing opioid use, which is chronic pain patients. Um, they, they've transitioned from acute to chronic pain. They're postpartum, after vaginal, we have people coming out in a few weeks on this, postpartum after vaginal delivery, um, not even with a tear, vaginal delivery uh, on the order of 1% of women started on opioids are still using them a year later. Like that sounds small, but think of all the births that happened in North America. We are, we are creating a lot of trouble with uh, with the liberal prescribing of these things. Okay, what about some adjuncts? Just quickly, uh, I think we use gabapentin and pregabalin mostly as a, as an opioid sparing agent, right? We're, we're trying to try a different modality. We're trying to avoid going up in opioid doses. We're just throw something in the patient to see if it works. We are experimenting, as I said before. There's a mechanism, these drugs, they look like they got some GABA look in aspects to their molecules, but really they, they block the influx of calcium at, at the nerve terminal that interferes with the release of a variety of neurotransmitters, and this is just how they work. Uh, it's not a GABA mechanism, despite the name. Um, they're just not very good for low back pain. I mean, so we've got pretty solid evidence now that they don't, don't work very well, and they have some harms. Um, they might be helpful for neuropathy. Okay, so there are 45 randomized trials of, uh, I'm not sure why it can move up the way it did, 45 RCTs of pregabalin. Um, and so for post repetitive neuralgia, a pretty decent NNT. And for diabetic neuropathy, they might work there too. But again, you know, NNT is in the 9 to sort of 20 range. So, so they might be helpful in that demographic. Uh, in terms of the harms here, there aren't a lot. It's really important, though, to appreciate that these drugs are exclusively eliminated by the kidney. And if your creatinine goes from 70 to 700, your, and your dosing is not commensurately adjusted, you're going to get into trouble. And this looks like myoclonus and ataxia and some, and even coma. Okay, so, so be very, very careful if you're going to try these drugs in a patient with, with advanced renal disease. Um, this is something I think isn't widely recognized. Here's a patient uh, of mine. Uh, oh, sorry, this is not a patient of mine. This is, this is from CMAJ. I've had a few patients like this. Here's a patient on pregabalin 300 twice a day. And after getting someone, someone said this is pregabalin and postgabalin. <laughs> so uh, I've had patients like this, and the usual story is they're, they've got very impressive edema. It's not responsive to diuretics. Someone does an echo, and they have a normal left ventricle, and they don't have TR, and they just keep diuresing them. And the furosemide goes up and up and up, and then this creatinine starts to decline. And then someone comes by and says, "Hey, maybe we should stop or get rid of the pregabalin, and that will often fix the problem." Um, I love. Ketamine. I mean, uh, not personally. I mean, I use it. I, I use it in the hospital all the time. Um, this is, I think, if you uh, work in a hospital, especially in an ED, but um, even on the wards. Like we we now have standardized order sheets for ketamine at my hospital that can be given in any ward throughout the hospital. You don't need special monitoring. My wife is an inter internist at University Health Network, and if they want to put somebody in ketamine, they have to go to the ICU. Which just blows my mind. You can give all the hydromorph, you can do all the skin popping with hydromorph on the wards you want, with such a thing aside, but you can't with ketamine. So this this drug is an NMDA antagonist, and we're not talking procedural sedation doses. We're talking about 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 mg per kilo over 15 minutes. And does it always work? No. Um, but man, when it works, it's impressive. Uh, it's a, it's it, it's just tinkering with pain signaling at a different part. Right, at NMD antagonist in the dorsal horn. Um, and here's a randomized trial from Sergey Mata of, of people with acute pain. They come into the eMERGE, they get a solid dose of ketamine or they get a dose of morphine. Uh, we'll say a 70 kilogram man gets around 20 mg of ketamine or a seven of morphine. 
This is a small RCT, but you can see that the pain reduction here is not trivial. Uh, it's not a good long-term therapy as an outpatient, but I mean, it's an option in hospitals that we, I think, can explore more. Um, and finally, cannabinoids. And I should just make the point. One of the reasons I'm so fond of ketamine is because in my individual patient level experiment where I'm trying to help more than harm, it's pretty hard to hurt somebody with 10 or 15 of ketamine. You can give it too fast and they can have a party in their head for a little while, right? But the worst case scenario is that they're just not quite themselves and you can learn it you gave too much too quickly and you know, adjust your dosing. So, so, so in other words, when you, in, in, in our patient level experiment where we're trying to help more than harm and we don't know before we've deployed the drug, whether it's going to help or harm, right? um, you stack the exercise in the patient's favor when you use a drug that's just not got a lot of baggage. Ketamine is one such drug. I think cannabinoids, I, uh, my thoughts on cannabinoids have evolved over the years. Um, uh, I won't unpack that comment more than I, <laughs> I mean to. Uh, but I mean, there is a mechanism by which they might work. I mean, they 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 interfere with. If there's a, there are CB1 receptors on the presynaptic termini of a, of, a, of a variety of systems that interfere with the release of GABA and glutamate and so forth. And you can see that it's got a bunch of there's there's a joke buried in here somewhere. If you take the time to read my my uh, <laughs> my, my comments, uh, but there's there is a pharmacological mechanism by which these drugs might relieve pain. Okay, they're just not very good at it. Okay, most of the Good data on cannabinoids comes from pharmaceutical cannabinoids, not from uh, you know twenty percent THC cigarette, but from nifixomols or so forth. And you can see the pain really is not that great. Now here's an old RCT using these are THC concentrations that by today's standards would be homeopathic, right? There's not much in the way of pain reduction, but I think we don't do a good enough job sometimes of distinguishing between pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. So here is. The patient's impression, global impression of change, again, with really small concentrations of THC. So, um, so I, I, you know, if, if I have a, this is for argument's sake, say I have an 80 year old man who's got bad spinal stenosis and he um, maybe is, I, I'm not going to be keen to put him on opioids chronically. I might even be wary for one reason or another of using NSAIDs, or maybe he's tried NSAIDs and they don't work. But if he says to me, hey, uh, Doc, I, uh, so I've been using, uh, I've been vaping this 5% THC a couple of times a night, and the pain doesn't go away entirely, but I feel I can sleep better. Like, I'm not going to argue with that, right? I mean, that, that's that's a useful anecdote, I think. I'll come back in just a minute. Um, there are some safety concerns. I think they're all pretty well understood. Um, there is an impression out there, especially among young people, that it's okay to drive while high. It's not okay to drive while you're uh, drunk, but you can't drive while you're high, and, and I mean that's just not true. I mean, there's very strong association between the use of this stuff and, and motor vehicle collisions. The usual clue is that they're driving, you know, half the speed limit, and there's a bag of Doritos in the passenger seat, and, and the cops can pick that up fairly easily. I wrote this piece a few years ago. Is it really nine years ago? Uh, about when the rules in Canada were changing around cannabis, and it wasn't meant to encourage the use of cannabis, but it was meant to make the point that if a patient using sensible, you know, low doses of cannabis comes to us and uh, and, and, and claims that it helps them, uh, why do we why do we just dismiss that? And we, we accept it rather freely for oxy or fentanyl. Uh, but the, ba the baggage of fentanyl, uh, the baggage of cannabis is not zero, but it's nothing compared to opioids and probably even NSAIDs, I would say. So I'm going to stop there and just kind of wrap up a little bit. So, so, so when we are relieving pain, we are conducting an experiment, and we can stack the odds in the patient's favor by choosing drugs that are inherently safer. Um, it's uh, opioids have come to prominence mainly because of marketing and our desire to help people, but just being misinformed about the benefits of the drugs. They're not stronger than NSAIDs, not safer than NSAIDs, even if you can construct in your mind a patient in whom you wouldn't touch with an NSAID. Um, in general, they're just not. Um, they have all kinds of harms that can be hard to appreciate, and they're a last resort for a reason. And I think the, the 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 biggest to me the biggest harm is still dependence because if you look at this little paradigm up here, benefits more than harms. Um, we assess whether we are helping based upon what the patient tells us, and this is why you know someone who's on 400 enemies of morphine, they've gotten that way over many years. They are adamant with this drug is helping them. 
And it's understandable. But what's really, by the time you've gotten to that sort of dose, what it's mainly doing is keeping withdrawal at bay. And that is not hard, that is not a benefit in the truest sense of the word. So, so I think we've got to be wary with the doses. I use opioids every day for acute pain, chronic pain sometimes, and end of life care all the time. But we got to stop viewing uh, tolerance as just something that we meet with rising doses. And we, I think we should view the inclination to bump the opioid dose up as a maybe a measure of therapeutic failure. And maybe we should be trying something else. So that's, uh, I don't know if that's what you wanted, but that's what you got. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, having me here. And I'll try and answer your question. Great, Thank David, uh, thanks very much. Very entertaining and uh, interesting presentation. Uh, maybe I'll start with my question. It's been bugging me since you said it early on. Can you please explain your statistics joke? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll get to the first question. Uh, macro and micro doses of psychedelics and chronic pain sufferers. Do you have any comment on that? Um, no. I, uh, I think it's largely the stuff of anecdote. I think, so we're talking here mainly about psilocybin. Is that what you're getting yes. at? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so my take on psilocybin, and I guess we're going to see more of this. I mean, the, the, most of the attention is around the realm of depression, right? Uh, I haven't reviewed the data recently, but my take on it is this. Psilocybin is an extremely safe compound. Yes, if you take five grams of mushrooms, you will be you will be in a very odd place in a couple of hours, right? And you'll be talking to deities and so forth, but you're not going to die. Unless you do something under the influence of mushrooms, you're not going to die from it. So if someone wants to experiment with 125 milligrams, we'll say, of psilocybin, or even lower dose, big deal, right? Experiment. Whether it's depression or pain, I don't, I'd be shocked if they do much for pain, really. But um, you're not going to hurt yourself, right? Uh, and I'm not advocating five grams of shrooms a day. Uh, <laughs> but but if someone wants to conduct an experiment to see if it helps them, their mood, their focus, their I, I've got limited expectations, but they are they're, they're going to experiment with a pretty safe drug. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, this is a question for me. Uh, it was interesting your comment about NSAIDs not being worse than opioids for analgesia. Is that still a message being taught in medical? nursing and pharmacy schools? Well, not at U of T, because I've insinuated myself into the curriculum. And I make this point very clear. But I think it's, I mean, I think a lot of docs, like, again, I held this belief myself. I also held the belief, I should mention, I held the belief for a long time that oxycodone was less potent than morphine. This is another really important misperception that Purdue is aware of and, 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 and did nothing to dispel. Um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, morphine was a cancer drug. Right, people come to the pharmacy with a prescription for MS content, they had cancer. But a decade later, they were coming to the pharmacy with prescriptions for oxycodone for chronic pain. And I just assumed wrongly that it must be less potent, but it's 50 to 100 percent, depending on your read. Um, I think I've talked around your question, Aaron. Can you, can you bring me back to the, the key point? Well, I guess my question is what, what chance do we have in getting it out of other? pharmacy, medical, and nursing schools, like, is, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, uh, I think people just need to be told it. The problem is that they, it's it's not, it's, it's when you tell someone that, uh, I know you perceive opioids to be stronger painkillers than NSAIDs, um, but it's not true. I think sometimes uh, it's just not really believed. You have to walk them through some of the literature, mm -hmm. there's vast literature on this, I've shown you only I think three studies, um, but it's still, I think it's a hard thing to shake because we, be, because of where they live, they live on the top of the pain ladder, not sure. because they're stronger than things beneath it, because you're meant to go to them last. You're meant to go to them last for a reason. Um, so I don't, I'm not a, an, an educator per se, but I think it's just a matter of us trying to undo 25 years of very effective marketing and, and, and practice and, and, and culture, uh, which needs to be changed. Okay. And on a related note, someone commented on that they were taught that there's no ceiling dose for opiates. So uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess that's a message that persists still. Well, this is, this is, we're describing tolerance and, and tolerance is another side effect. I mean, to the extent that your dose response curve shifts to the right and you need more to achieve the same effect, but that only happens because you were on the drugs. And tolerance is the process 
that, that causes the unwitting clinician just to go up and up and up in the face of inadequate analgesia. And then all the other baggage side effects, the ones I peppered that slide with, they just mm -hmm. intensify. Which is, which is, I think it's really incumbent upon us not to never use opioids, but to stop putting people on three or 400 milligrams of morphine a day as we didn't even think twice about 20 years ago. Okay, thanks, David. I'll give you a chance to grab a sip of water. I just wanted to yeah. remind the participants that uh, we will be sending you an evaluation by email. And if you're interested in continuing education credits, just fill out the evaluation, send it back. And within a couple of days, you'll get all the information you need to claim those credits. Uh, David, off to the next question. Do you have a script or uh, phrases that you use when you speak to patients about not starting or not escalating a dose or proposing a taper? How do you approach the discussion? Well, very, very different animals. Uh, uh, and I'm going to focus on your third point. I mean, patients, um, I don't, it's not very often that I just refuse to start a patient in opioids. If they're in pain, I'll try them. I mean, I don't know if they can work or not, but I'm, I'm not averse to trying them. I just think it's what we do after we try them that's really important. It's the third group of patients that you touched on about tapering, and that is uh, a real difficult topic at time. So, um, so keep in mind that someone, let's take a hypothetical patient. Of, of, I've had many, many of these over the years. Let's say someone who's on 400 MMEs a day, they're on like a fentanyl 100 mic patch, or they're taking some oral product, and they've gotten that way over five or 10 years. Okay. Um, I think that that patient is on balance being harmed more than helped, and I think that they would be in a better health state if we could get them down to 300 or 200 or maybe even 100. But that is something that uh, would take months, if not years, to do. Uh, I probably were taking the buprenorphine, actually, would be my first step, but, uh, but it requires a long discussion. I'll pull up a chair, and this is not a 10-minute encounter, it's in 45 minutes or an hour. And what I do in those sessions is I try to um, help the patient realize that there might, despite how, in these patients, I should mention, they, you know, they are, they're all intensely dependent. They are just a missed dose or two away from abject misery, and they know it, and they fear it, and they prioritize not being in that state. And I, I think we have to do the same. I mean, you cannot destabilize these, you can't pull the rug up underneath them and do to them what Travis Reeder did to himself. So, um, so I sit down and I have a discussion and I try to help them understand that there is merit in a gradual dose reduction. I'm very curious to know what's on that napkin. Uh, uh, and there will be one of two responses, generally speaking. Uh, uh, some patients will say, okay, we'll try it and we're gonna go very, very slowly and we're gonna try and do our best to keep you out of withdrawal and, and, and we will take as long as we need. There are some patients who just say, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I try to make the case that I think that their depression and their mood, even their pain could be better six or 12 months from now, if, if people don't want to even brook the discussion, mm -hmm. I, I think that sometimes that is, not always, but sometimes that is a, it's a marker of a, of a poorly concealed opiate use disorder and an iatrogenic opiate use disorder. Um, and that patient needs a different kind of help. So uh, okay. it's a long winded way of answering one third of your question. <laughs> I appreciate it though. Um, we've got about five, four minutes left. So this is going to be rapid fire, if you don't mind. Uh, do we actually know that benzodiazepines with opiates are worse than other sedatives like methocarbamol or cyclobenzaprine or tricyclics? Uh, well, we have better data. I mean, uh, okay. and the best data are published by a, a Park is the first author in BMJ about five or six years ago. Very elegant study showing that uh, the dose dependency of the risk of overdose death with both opioids and benzos, and especially in combination. So that's a paper I point people to. The, the other, any CNS depressant, I mean, one plus one is five. It's, just, it's a pharmacodynamic drug interaction, and, and bad things will happen. You put somebody on 900 of gabapentin with opioids, the risk is going to go up too. We don't have the same sort of data with the other drugs you've mentioned, uh, but I think we should just, it, it's intuitive that when you have a patient on a sedating drug and you add another, that we, we won't be surprised that the patient has a fall at two in the morning or, you know, uh, so um, that's my stab at your question. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question, uh, what's your perspective on cannabinoids for acute post-surgical pain, for example, mm -hmm. complex ankle fracture? 
Yeah, I mean, I would, I probably wouldn't use it. If somebody said they're going to bake instead of take Percocet, I'd say go ahead. It helps you, right? So, but maybe you don't want to be doing the shatter uh, five times a day. Like I'm just, I'm just talking about the, the concentrates, right? Mm -hmm. Again, here, the dose makes the poison. I, I think someone who tells me, I'll just, I'll turn your question around a bit. A chronic pain patient who says, yes, I, I consume uh, five, one gram cannabis cigarettes a day, and it's 25% THC. That's not a healthy exercise. I mean, they might tell themselves it's it's needed in helping them, but the dose needs to be kept low. Okay. Um, we're someone's commenting on uh, seeing more ketamine use disorder, many with ketamine induced hemorrhagic cystitis. Yeah. Yeah. So, so cystitis and less commonly, I think, uh, sort of cholangiopathy, those are really the main two uh, consequences of long term ketamine use. And I've seen it only in people who use the drug recreationally, but of course, it's going to happen. If people go to chronic pain clinics and get this stuff monthly, it'll happen periodically. And it can be, you know, when it's when it's not identified and the patient continues using, it can be just disastrous and it can need urinary diversions and so forth. Like it's, a, it's really a, it's an important side effect for us to be aware of. And I, if I was giving a talk on ketamine, I would have impacted. it. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. Can you my, provide my, your my, insight? Sorry? I know I was going to say, my, my, I'm talking about ketamine in the two, three, five day hospitalization, that's my that's where I'm coming at ketamine from, not from a sure. long term chronic pain perspective. Good, understood. Um, can you provide your insight on codeine and tramadol use in the context of your patient level experiment paradigm? And in addition to that, thoughts on transferring patients from long term tramadol to a different opioid? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's that I'm not a fan, a fan of tramadol. So I think it, there. If, if you have the inclination to start somebody on an opioid, neither codeine nor tramadol, it makes sense. They just, they're not rational decisions. Now, I'll start, uh, codeine's a bit easier to unpack. So codeine, we're all so familiar with it, and it was very popular in Canada, in part because it lived in Tylenol 2 and 3, which you could phone in for decades. You didn't need a written prescription for it, unlike morphine. Codeine isn't an analgesic. I mean, codeine is a, it's an inert, it comes from the poppy, but it's inert and it has to be turned into morphine by your liver by an enzyme called cytochrome p452d6 all cyp2d6 does is take a methyl group off of codeine turns it into morphine and the important point about that is that that process varies tremendously from person to person cyp2d6 is extremely polymorphic seven percent of caucasians have none some people have multiple copies of the gene so what that means is that when you give somebody a known amount of codeine, say six, say 60 milligrams of codeine, what you're really doing is giving them an unknown amount of morphine. Might be zero, might be six, might be nine-ish, right? You don't know. So in your individual patient level experiment, why are you dropping into this mix a, 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 a drug with unpredictable kinetics? And you like, why don't you just give morphine? You want to give an opiate, just give morphine or hydromorph. Tramadol is, is, is similar in terms of its enzyme activation. It's more complicated because the parent compound isn't inert. It's an SNRI, but um, uh, neither. So I, I will prescribe those drugs to people who come into hospital and they're on them and they seem to be doing okay, even if I think they should probably come down. I, I'll just continue them, uh, but they are not drugs that I think we should be starting because they're just, they're just pharmacologically irrational. Okay. And uh, it's 9.32. So maybe if you're okay with one more question, yeah. Uh, okay. So Inside. someone brought up a paper about uh, adolescents and young adults being exposed to opioids through dental clinicians. Do you have any comments on that or as a source yeah. of the problem? Or Sure. I mean, uh, so most, that, that's going to generally be for third mold, wisdom tooth extractions. Uh, most people don't need opioids for that. See, if an ibuprofen will generally do the job. There might be somebody out there who can't, for one reason or ticket and said, and it's fine to use a short course of an opioid. I would personally probably use a little bit of methasone and a tiny bit of morphine if I had to some see a minute and maybe a tiny bit of morphine if I really had to. Uh, I think that that sort of prescribing still happens. Uh, uh, I think it's becoming less common. Uh, I think dentists know that they are uh, very often giving much more opioid than a patient is really ever going to need. And, and, and the two main downsides of that are the patient's 
keeps taking the drug. And I've had a couple of patients over the years whose first experience, who, who, who's, who come to me with endocarditis or cellulitis from their injection drug use. And the story when you unpack it is that 15 years ago, they just fell in love with Percocet after it then was back. Um, so I think it still happens. It's it's a tougher audience to reach. Um, and I think we should be generally discouraging it, even if you can think of some scenarios where it might be a problem. Okay. Um, David, uh, Tom is telling me that there are people in the room that want to ask you questions. So maybe I'll yeah. turn it over to Tom and then he can wrap up yeah. when he's finished. Sure. Thank Thanks. You. As long as I make my plane, we're good. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, there were um, several questions. I'm going to call on Professor Izzy Lahir, French, please. Make sure you speak clearly to this. So I'm very peripheral to this area, but I noticed that in a number of the slides on side effects, sleep related issues were regular visitors. Sleep related issues yeah. were? were? Were regular features in your yeah. field. So, what is the link? And can you predict which of these agents will cause sleep related? Yeah, so the, so the question uh, pertains to sleep issues, and really that's where they're on opioids, right? So opioids do a couple of things. First of all, they very clearly alter sleep architecture. Um, uh, the other thing they do is they are a risk factor, a dose dependent and potentially reversible risk factor for um, central and obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and I think it's sort of intuitive. Uh, the In terms of predicting it, there is a, there's a, a score it's called stop bang is the, is the score. The yeah, details yeah. of it elude me at the moment, even though I'm a co-author on a paper that studied it. <laughs> but the higher the score, the higher the risk. And the higher the dose, the higher the risk. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Jim Wright, our founding director of the Therapeutics Initiative, who uh, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, David, but Jim is actually the, the most distinguished clinical pharmacologist. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jim would like to ask a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So, do you think anybody's going to ever uh, discover a effect of analgesic? Because we really don't have, I would say that we don't have really highly effective analgesic. Well, and if we did, it would change everything. We would change yeah. all of the things that you, you try. So, the question is yeah, will, will there ever be a, well, make the ideal analgesic? I mean, yeah. all of the drugs I've talked about. Can be effective sometimes. Right? Yeah. No, I know uh, that. So, but if you're asking me, is that I, I don't think it's likely that we will ever come up with a drug that relieves pain in everybody. Like people are just different. People vary in all kinds of ways that some of which we understand, some of which we don't. Uh, and even if someone came up, even if one day someone introduced a molecule that was a very effective analgesic and it worked and was safe in 80 or 90 percent of people, I mean, what a boom that would be. And what a what a what an opportunity for the company and for medicine generally. Uh, but there's still going to be some people who don't respond to it. It's, just, it's the nature of drug therapy. There is no drug that works in everybody and is is, is, is safe and effective in everybody. So I don't, you know, uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would be surprised if and I, I would welcome new analgesics that have sort of more favorable safety profiles. But I don't see a day where we've got some magic bullet that fixes all the pain and, and doesn't cause trauma. There's a lot of research, though, I mean, going on, right? and nothing seems to be coming. So it's just a... Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a, a very it's a fertile area. and important yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, we have one more question uh, live from Dr. Guillaume Grenet, who's just joined us visiting from Lyon, France. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I was uh, wondering, uh, we saw the COX inhibitors uh, program, then uh, the opioid issue, and uh, in your thought, what will be the next uh, program uh, the, the, with uh, analgesics? Okay, so you're referring to the COX, the, the COX-2 inhibitor problem. Yeah. So what so what Guillaume is referring to there, for those who don't have the same lengthy lens that some of us in the room. So in, in 2004, Merck, I want to say Merck, took Vioxx off the market, mm -hmm. right? Brooke Coxid, which is sort of a sister drug of Celecoxid. And they did that after publication of a randomized trial that out of Toronto called the VIGOR trial. In the VIGOR trial, it, be, it was very clear, the comparator in that study was naproxen, that there was a sizable signal of cardiac events. And I think it was the VIGOR uh, in, in patients who got um, Brooke Coxid. And, and I think it was that sort of trial that sort of raised the possibility in our minds that maybe NSAIDs are 
more of a risk factor for vascular events than we thought. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk about them in my um, discussion here. It's a separate talk, but um, they disrupt the balance of prostacycline and thromboxane and, and favor a prothrombotic state in some people. So another way of saying that is that in an 80-year-old on NSAIDs who has an MI, um, you know, there's a non-zero probability that the NSAID has something to do with that MI. Mm -hmm. And it might be a factor that comes into your decision-making, whether to start it or stop it. Um, I, I don't think, the, I think celecoxib is generally a safer molecule than lopicoxib. And so I, I think that we've, um, over the last 20 years, come to learn a lot about this phenomenon, but it's not something that, that has a major bearing on how I use these drugs. And maybe I haven't answered your question. Oh, you were asking about what, what's going to happen next. Yeah, what's going to happen I don't next? know. I guess we'll see. I, I think what we're going to see is uh, a lot of people using cannabis for pain who develop cannabis use disorder mm -hmm. uh, and don't have terrific pain relief, but who are convinced that the cannabis is essential to their ongoing well-being because without it, they feel miserable. They have a different kind of withdrawal mm -hmm. and not nearly as dramatic as opiate withdrawal, but I think we'll see lots of people using cannabis for chronic pain who are just basically stoned all the time. And uh, that's, I think that's... I think a real threat, actually. Yeah. David, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank you for this beautiful uh, webinar.